Well, it really is a, a blessing to be with the saints this morning, and um, I'd love to hear you guys sing. And uh, this, is a, this has been a really uh, beautiful week. I'm, I haven't expected this kind of sunlight to be this far into the Pacific Northwest uh, and this far into the fall, and so it's been great. The Lord's been giving us uh, plenty of reasons to rejoice. But as we approach um, what we're going to be getting into today, I hope that you guys, I don't have one because I didn't ask for one, but uh, you should have some notes um, that were in your bulletin, and that's going to give you the outline of the message we're going to be in today. And it's called Blessed Are the Humble, and that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount, but you'll see why I titled that here in a minute. But we've been seeing, even as we've been in First Peter, um, that humility is very basic to the Christian life. Uh, this is not a false humility as the world puts forward, uh, one in to, to which you're still truly pointing at yourself. This is a true humility where it's constantly recognizing what the Lord has given you. There's a sensibility, a, a, a balance in the fact that the Lord has given us different giftings and different um, different skills and abilities, different places that he's placed us. Just if you think about Acts 17, when it talks about how God sovereignly places us in all of the different places in life that, and the different families that we're connected to, the, whether we have much or we have little, um, all of these things, we need to recognize that our gifts from the Lord, uh, those are our stewardship. And how we use not only the bodies we have and the skills we've been given, but what resources we have available to us, um, we, we need to recognize what those are and be able to use those for God's glory. And not just in serving ourselves, as the world seems to want to do, that every single person out there in the world is going to desire to get more riches and to get more fame and to get more skills and abilities, maybe that they can't even have. You know, the Disney uh, worldview has the idea that um, you can be whatever you want. But that's not the biblical way of thinking. We must humble ourselves and we must realize that there is a balance, there is a measure of what God has given us. Some will have more than others. And then once we recognize what it is that God has given us in our lives and, and, and measured out those abilities and, and known what they are, we, we, we steward those. And we steward those by serving others in humble service. And there's no better example that we've been given um, than by our Lord in John 13. In John chapter 13, we're in the Gospel of John, and I know we're jumping in, and it's, it's not like we're doing a series on this. Maybe one day that would be great to do. Uh, we've been doing that in um, youth group. Uh, so if you just want to, you know, come sit in a youth group. But we're already all the way in chapter 19, so you'd miss most of it. But um, the Gospel of John is rich, and it is an amazing gospel. We could go, in through, go through it hundreds and thousands of times and never um, dig the depths of riches in it. Um, but you could essentially split the Gospel of John um, into four parts, um, just, just approaching the Gospel of John. Um, many of you know one of the things that, that we're drawn to the Gospel of John for is his prologue, chapter 1, 1 through 18. And in the prologue of Gospel of John, he gives us something that none of the other Gospel writers give us, and that is um, the pre-incarnate Christ, where he was residing and who he was before he came into the world, before he took on flesh. And he is the one true God, God the Son, the Word who became flesh. So you'd have the prologue, and then the rest of chapter 1, going all the way to chapter 12, would be Jesus' public ministry that John records, and he has so much that is different than the other gospel writers. Well, why is that? It's not a synoptic, synoptic gospel. Um, the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are, are called the synoptic gospels. I can't say that word this morning, apparently, um, but th that's a seeing together. Uh, they, they have very many um, of the same uh, accounts of Jesus. Uh, there's, they all have their unique aspects, of course, but much of what's recorded in each of those Gospels is very similar, and that's great because when we want eyewitness accounts, we want it from multiple points of view, and, 
And um, we do get that from the Gospel of John. However, John writes much later than the rest of the writers, and he realizes there's still much to be said about the life of Jesus. And we even learn at the end of the Gospel of John that there could be so many books written about the life of Jesus, and there would never be enough time or enough books to write all of those accounts in. But he does give us some unique aspects, and he fills in some of the gaps for us in, John, in, in Jesus' public ministry. And then we get to Jesus' private ministry, which is 13 through 17. Well, why do I call it private? Well, now he's not speaking to um, the crowds, the masses. His audience are Christians only, those who are followers of him. And shortly before, it's time for him to go to his passion, which we could say the rest of the Gospel of John would be his passion. The record of, the, of John's, uh, or John recording Christ's ministry as he goes to die for the sins of his people and is raised on the third day. So where we find ourselves in the Gospel of John is in chapter 13, and this is the beginning, um, and it's not necessarily the first time he's ministered, that's not what we mean by that, um, but it's the beginning of that, this unique upper room discourse to the 12 disciples. Um, he's been ministering to them all along, even in his public ministry, but now he has some special words just for them. And before he even gets started, we see it begins with action. And so, as we get into this, let us start in actually verse 1, and so that we can get a little bit more of the context. Starting in verse 1, chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, and that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments. And taking a towel, he tied it around himself. Then he poured water into the wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he had tied around himself. So he came to Peter. He said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not realize now, but you will understand afterwards. And Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet, ever. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who has bathed and needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, Not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet, and he had taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I do not speak about all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives anyone I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Let me pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful text of Scripture that records a unique private moment in the life of Jesus and his disciples. 
Help us now to listen carefully to what this passage has to say to each and every one of us. Let us learn from it. Let us set aside our pride and our sin. And let us realize, Lord, that you are here to work through us, through your spirit, so that we might be changed into the image and likeness of this very Jesus who we read about. In Jesus' name, amen. In this upper room scene, our Lord gives us four fundamentals of sacrificial love so that you might obey him and in obeying him, experience the happiness that God promises in that. And I'll say that again. The Lord gives us four fundamentals of sacrificial love so that you might obey him and in that obedience, experience the happiness that God promises. And we'll, we'll flesh that out as we go, but as you see in, in the outline, verses four through 11, you could say five through 11, but I'm including some of the verbs in, chap, in, in verse four, is the demonstration, does Christ's humility move you? And 12 through 15 is the expectation, do you imitate your savior? And 16 through 17, the participation, do you find happiness in serving? And 18 through 20, the contemplation, has Christ's word changed you. And let's begin with the demonstration, the demonstration. First, in Christ's demonstration, Christ's forthcoming actions are based in his love to the end for his people, for his disciples. It says he loved them to the end, those who were his own, who were in the world. There is a special love that Christ has for his people, And notice, he doesn't just say he has love for them. He demonstrates that love. Look what he does. Look in the verbs that are used here. He rose up. He laid aside his clothing, taking the towel. He tied it around, girded himself. He placed and cast the water into a washman. He began to wash, to wipe the disciples' feet. And then afterwards, after he was done doing this action to every one of the disciples, Imagine that quiet room as they watch their Lord wash each one's feet. He placed back on his outer garment, he reclined again, and he spoke. Overall, this is a powerful presentation of humble service. Jesus was giving preference to the disciples. He was honoring them above himself and outdoing the disciples in selfless service. He was raising them up and lowering himself truly in the form of a servant. And really, this whole, all of these actions taken together, if we could call it one act of humble service, there is, there is some amazing symbolism in it, and we'll get to that in a moment. But before we get to that, we have to look at this and look at the inclination of sinners through the ages to then make perhaps a ritual out of this. You might ask the question, well, because Jesus did did this, should I go and wash my brother's feet? Literally. Like, should I be, as an elder, going down and washing each one of your feet? It's a good question, right? Um, And when we actually look at this in a, in a historical perspective, in, in, a, in a perspective of the culture, this was a, a very common practice in the first century. And you have to ask that question, why? Well, because people traveled places, not on cars. All right, they didn't have cars back then. They didn't have horses, but you had to be far wealthier to have one of those beasts of burden. And so the most common way to travel would be by foot, on dirty roads, and you could, at, I mean, you're on your way to a banquet. You just cleaned up. You're ready to go. You got your best, best stuff on. And now, by the time you get there, your feet are all dirty because the road have, has gotten dirt all over them from the travel. And so it was a common practice for you to enter that room into someone's house. And um, uh, they would have a servant available. Probably the lowest, lowest, lowliest servant in the house would stop. You'd sit down, and they, you'd allow that servant to wash off your feet. It's probably be something somebody uh, serving in that household, especially in a in a in a more wealthy household, that uh, somebody you'd hardly even notice is there. This is the lowliest thing that you can do. Well, let's 
destroy the ritualism right now and recognize that this is not a sacra- sacrament or ordinance like we think of the Lord's Supper or baptism. This act is, is, the act itself is not what Christ is teaching. He's using it, something that's common in their time, to, to, to demonstrate something to us, a teaching, a powerful teaching through this demonstration. But let us, let us not miss the lesson that's in the very fact that there are some people who take this as a sacrament or something that we must do. And that is, that would be, well, for one, um, this is a narrative, and narrative is not normative. But if we start to take everything out of the text and make it something that we ought to do, that's, there's a legalism bound up in that. This, this ritualism that we see in, in errors like the, the Roman church, for instance, or other cults, who make it all about doing something outwardly. Uh, That's not what this is here for. Notice a good example of this is that in this account that that John gives us, he doesn't, he he calls it a supper that they're having, but he doesn't mention specifically the same title as many of the other gospel writers, writers mention, he doesn't say the Lord's Supper. Does that mean that's not what they're practicing? Well, we get a description that this is what's going on, it is the Lord's Supper, it is that sacrament that he gave to um, the disciples that is recorded for that purpose in the other synoptic gospels, but it's, it's, awfully, um, it's, it's awfully humbling to think John didn't call attention to that sacrament. Well, why? Well, I would say it's for the same reason that you see in 1 Corinthians, Paul minimizing baptism at the very beginning of it. He minimizes baptism, why? Not because it's not important, because in that moment, those Christians had got their priorities all out of line. And it's something I even talked about with some, some uh, brothers earlier this week, the issue of, we call it sometimes theological triage. The idea that you, some doctrines are more important than others. 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel is of first importance. And in and, and different moments and different times and different seasons, we must realize that we must put aside lesser doctrines and focus on what's important when someone has lost track of what's important. And here, as always, what's most important is Christ and what he's doing and he's expressing in this. You see, if if we get into the danger of making it all about the externals, we'll be like the Pharisees. And Jesus said that they're whitewashed tombs with dead men's bones inside. Well, this describes some of you here today. It's what you've been doing. You've been hiding your sin and whether it's porn on your device, whether it's the fact that you need to go to your spouse and ask for forgiveness, or whether you've been stealing time at work. You need to search your own heart and ask, am I a Christian who comes to church to hide my sin? John likely leaves the Lord's Supper explicitly not mentioned out of this narrative to help us understand, kind of like Paul did in 1 Corinthians, that there's other things more important right now. And in fact, the very beginning of this upper room discourse, Christ has really the most powerful demonstration and teaching to start off this discourse with. Christ himself stooping down and washing his disciples' feet. And in the act as a whole, we can also see, and I mentioned earlier, the symbolism, the symbolism of this event that's recorded for us as a whole. Notice, there's a verb used, his rising up. It really, in some senses, gives us a picture of his whole ministry. What did Jesus have to do to accomplish his work. He rose up from the Father's side. He laid aside his glory. He took on the form of a servant in his incarnation. He he veiled that glory intentionally so that he could live among us. And then he went about his work. And really this washing and wiping that's 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 pictured here and what he's doing as he's as he's washing their feet. The water itself could be seen as that cleansing and that purifying of sin that Christ does. Psalm 119.9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping according to his word. Christ is the word incarnate. 
Ephesians 5, 25 through 26, um, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. There's this idea of cleansing with water that is used in, the, in, in a spiritual, spiritual way. And the washing of Christ in this act is, is picturing, if we look at it in this particular way, in his ministry as a whole, this ongoing renewal of sanctification in the life of the people, of his people, you and I. Our whole is purified when we are justified. We are purified from all sin. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, like the Roman Catholics, that we have to keep getting infusions of grace. The grace of Christ is enough. It is finished. But that doesn't mean that now we go along in our lives and we commit sins that we need to bring before the Lord. It's, a, it's the difference between, for instance, um, imagine just a filthy garment, a filthy white garment that is so, so disgusting that if you were to drop another stain on it, you'd hardly notice. Well, that's all of us before we get saved. But then just take that na- same white garment, right, and then, you know, I'm pretty notorious for, notorious for this, get a little tiny stain on it, and you notice it, and you're like, oh man, that's really sticking out. Well, that's the Christian life. We've been cleansed by Christ. We're completely white, but when we go and we sin, we get that little stain on us. Well, what do you do in order to remove that stain, in order to, to, to get that removed? You've got to go before Christ and get, go back to that same fountain that cleansed you in the first place in order to be clean. Again, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then finally, that putting on and reclining, those verbs at the end of this demonstration could symbolize really his ascension back to the Father. Because really, look, we got a little, a little bit of an outline in, in verse 3. He had come forth from God and he was going back to God. That getting up and sitting back down after putting on his garments is him taking back on that glory after accomplishing his work going back to the Father's right hand and sitting down, showing that his work is complete. There's something beautiful in this demonstration that Christ give a, gives us. But ultimately, all these actions as a whole, as they symbolize the work of Christ, um, and, and, and as we look at what he's done, we, we should not miss what John intentionally records for us in the midst of what he's doing here. And that, that's second the Lord and Peter's exchange. It's very important to not bypass what happens between the Lord and Peter during this time. So, in verse six, he came to Simon Peter and he said to him, that is Peter, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I am going to do you do not now realize, but you will understand afterwards. And Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet ever. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter then responded to that, saying, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. You see this, the the disciple who liked to put his foot in his mouth. All right, this is another great demonstration of that. We see Peter's personality come right out. And we can learn a lot from Peter. I love how Peter is the first one to pipe up because His actions here are recorded for us for a reason. We are called to obey Christ without delay. Peter should have been willing and ready to allow his master and Lord to wash his feet. There are many things that we do in this life without delay. For instance, if I go to your house and we're talking and this oven's on and I set my hand down on the oven, (laughs) as soon as I feel that, I'm pulling my hand away right? Same thing with a, with a really hot piece of metal on a sunny day. You accidentally lean on it, what quickly you're going to take your hand away. It's Christ, our Lord. When he commands something to delay, is sin. Refusal to do what is commanded is pride, and deeper, it's, it's distrust in God's secret deal, his sovereign hand 
because we may not completely understand what he intends right away, right? Because this is what, this is what Jesus says. He says, he, he lets them know, I'm not going to tell you right now what I'm doing. You just need to accept it, and later I'll explain it to you. We must have childlike faith. It's kind of a, a learned contentment in remaining uninformed. He doesn't, always, and he doesn't have the obligation to always inform us why he does these things. That's the way it is with a lot of authority that God has ordained in our life. There's, you're not always obligated to get to know why something is done. We should not be worried that we are in the dark concerning some of the things that God wishes to be hidden from us for a time. And this kind of content in this uninformed state is more learned than any other kind of uh, state, and when we, especially a sort of state where we're, we're lacking information. And when we let God be wiser than we are, we're expressing true faith and trust in his care for us. When we're obstinate in it, that's error, that's sin, something we need to repent of. When we're obedient, that is only done by faith, by the power of God working in us. True wisdom and faith approves and embraces by faith whatever comes from God. If we cannot decide what, whatever God does, he does for our good, for the best reason, our flesh will stubbornly refuse to obey in those moments. We need to trust, trust that God has our best in mind. And until you renounce the sin of judging the works of God, you will not be living in obedience to him. God has created you. He's given you everything. And he promises to take care of you, even when sometimes that's hard to see. Uh, notice, let's just take the average Christian for a moment. Jack has something against his Christian brother, and God's word says, Jack must drop everything and go and be reconciled to his brother. And yet Jack decides, ah, ah that's a tough thing to do. I think I'm just going to I think I'm just going to pray about it. I'm just going to pray about it. I'm just going to go before the Lord and pray. Yeah, I feel a little bit better now after I've prayed. I have a peace about it. I, I, I think I don't need to do this. Yeah, yeah, I have a peace about it. Is that right? Is, is Jack in the right doing that? No. He knows what needs to be done. He has enough light to know that in this situation, it does not call for prayer. It does not call for having a peace about it. It calls for going directly to his brother and being reconciled because in Christ we have no reason ever to be separated from anyone in this world. God has reconciled us to himself. That is the, that, that is the most important relationship that has been mended and now we seek reconciliation with our brothers. If you live this way, you're, you're never going to... Um, really truly experience the blessings of God in, in, in the obedience that he's explaining here. And really, if you continue to be disobedient, you're going to create a, a sort of tension in your own heart. You're going to be, become calloused to the continued light and truth God's, God gives you until you actually do what you're called to do. In some senses, it can be too late to do the right thing, but you can still go and you can still repent and you can still seek out reconciliation. And that's just one example. There's so many others. Peter's immediate response, once again, looking back at the text for Peter, we, can, we, might, we might label that pietistic legalism, a, a holy rebellion. Um, I can do it myself. I... I I'm being very righteous in this moment, Lord. Uh, I want to exalt you. No, that's not what the Lord wants in this moment. Your thoughts are never as God's. Even a Christian's thoughts slip into man's thoughts, into fleshing, fleshly thinking. A lot of times we either imagine that God is like us or we imagine God like uh, or excuse me, we imagine ourselves like God. We lift ourselves up to God's perspective. All right, it's neither of those things. You're a creature, and God is the creator. And so God gets to make commands upon and demands upon our life, and we must obey. A, a, a Christian is continually taught by God. He is the one who is all-knowing, and we are, we are creatures without 
um, really, we're ignorant. We begin lacking information, um, and, and we have to learn from others, and we have to learn from the Word of God, and, and constantly, we have far, far more information available to us than many of us are willing to sit down and learn about, to open God's Word, to memorize His Word. Really, this, is a, this is, should bring to mind, does your Bible collect dust on the shelf like many Christians today? Paying attention to all his commands matter, and we need to pay attention to the details, and that way you'll actually know what you're supposed to do in any given situation. Never trust yourself. Never trust your own heart. And Peter did that in this moment, and so he had to, in a sense, repent. You see, Christ responds to him, and he says, you have no part with me if, if you do not allow me to do this action. In that sense, he's saying, um, you're not going to have any fellowship with me if you don't allow me to serve you first. Think of regeneration in the Christian life. We must first come humbly before God and just drop everything and say, Lord, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm un- unable to do this. I have no power in myself to save myself. And then he comes, and God's the one that saves us. We believe that. Amen? Amen? But there's still an element of that that happens in the Christian life. We realize we don't have the power in and of ourselves, and so we've got to keep going back to that fountain, as I said earlier. And the washing, that searching out of the word in the presence of God. We've got to root out that sin in our lives. And he gives us a gracious gracious provision of all that we need to deal with sin in our lives. God's washing in the word is both preservative and preventative against the overflow of sin in the heart. Psalm 139, 23 through 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. You see, there's humility just played out in that very expression. When Christ gives him those sobering words, you're not going to have any part with me unless you allow me to do this. And Peter's second response, we could call pietistic antinomianism. A so-called holy license to sin. Uh, this, this is an underestimation of your part to play and, and not a real dependence on God. It's as we read earlier in Philippians chapter 2. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You are called to do something. You can't just sit back and let Jesus take the wheel. That new birth is a complete cleansing for all time. However, now you've been given the ability to obey. So when you hear those words, when you're given that light, don't go back to the, to the mud puddle of sin. Uh, embrace your part in seeking after Christ and go to that fountain of ongoing cleansing so, and, those, and, and give him those parts that need cleansing. Confess those sins. Both, both of Peter's responses put together, we can see at least with Peter, and, and many of us too can recognize this, the bad pattern is saying that you will submit and then not doing it. That puts you in a really dangerous place. You can go and profess all day that I'm going to be obedient to Christ, but if your life doesn't bear that out, it's a dangerous place to be. Well, what we see in Peter is a better pattern at least. He doesn't submit at first, but then he does afterwards. It's much like the parable of the two sons. That one son says, yeah, dad, I'll go do that. And then he doesn't. The other son says, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. And then later he comes back and he repents and he does what he's been asked to do. But we shouldn't strive for either of those two patterns. We should strive for the best pattern, and that is Christ. He was always, always obedient and submissive to the Father. He never wavered. That is the standard, and it never comes down. And we need to recognize that. Only Christ can interpret and apply his word in you. Therefore, you must put yourself in the way of the means of the grace, means of grace regularly. A.W. Pink, on the reality of, and really, we've been talking about different aspects here of what we call progressive sanctification. A.W. Pink says this, Our daily contact with evil all around causes the dust of defilement to settle upon us so that the mirror of our conscience is dimmed and the spiritual affections of our heart are dulled. We need to come afresh into the presence of Christ in order to learn what things really are, surrendering ourselves to his judgment in everything 
and submitting to his purging word. And who is there that, even for a single day, lives without sin? Who is there that does not need to daily pray, forgive us our trespasses? Only one has ever walked here and been unsoiled by the dust of earth. He went as he came, unstained, uncontaminated. But who is there among his people that does not find much in his daily walk that makes him blush for shame? How much unfaithfulness we all have to deplore. Let me but compare my walk with Christ's. And unless I am blinded by conceit or deceived by Satan, I shall at once see that I, am, I come completely, infinitely short of him. And though following his steps, not in his steps, as so, is so often misquoted, but is but afar off, so often my acts are unchristlike in character. So often my disposition and ways have the flesh stamped on them. Even evil does not break out does not break out in open forms, even when evil does not break out in over open forms, we are conscious of much of the hidden wrong, of sins of thought, of vile desires. How real then, how deep is our daily need of putting our feet in the hands of Christ for cleansing, that everything which hinders communion with him may be removed, and that he can say of us, you are clean." Well, now we turn from Christ's demonstration to the expectation. This is verses 12 through 15, the expectation. And in John, starting in verse 12, it says, So when he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to watch, wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Our, la- our Lord now makes explicit what he hid first from his disciples, and especially Peter, because he really wanted to know. Christ is first presented to Christians here as a teacher who teaches them in truth. And not just here, but when we are first come before Christ, he's a teacher. He's someone we see that is teaching truth But once that teaching takes root by the work of God, Christ becomes Lord over us by faith and repentance. Verse 14, Christ says to his own that he is the Lord and teacher. He is Lord first to his people and continues to teach them. In unbelief, you refuse to submit to Christ, but in faith, you willingly, joyfully submit to him. Our Lord gives the expectation of his servants and slaves. The Greek word obligation here. Christians are ob- ob- obligated, excuse me, obliged, obligated. <laughs> I wanted to say obliged, I'm like, that's not right. Um, Christians are obligated. The word is often used for someone who owes a debt. The one in debt is bound in an obligation to repay that debt. However, the sense in which it's being used here is not concerning a debt, especially in the sense of being a financial debt, but rather this is a moral command. Your debt has been paid by Christ, therefore you obey out of thankfulness and a desire to please your Lord and Master. The, the obligation you have to Christ is that there is nothing left you can give him other than be obedient. He doesn't need your works. He asks for your works. He is, a, he is a master that is kind and compassionate and has given you everything you need already. And so when he asks something of you, you should jump up ready and willing. Ready and willing to obey because he is a kind master. He's a kind Lord. He is not an evil master like sin that promises something he can never give you, that may give you pleasure, maybe even immediate pleasure, but will always come back and torment you for doing what, well, it convinced you to do. You ought to do the same just as Christ did, but not exactly as Christ did, right? In other words, we're not going to go around and washing other people's feet, but we see how it applies. We're not going to make it a legalistic ritual, but rather we want to see how do I, in a sense, wash 
the feet of my fellow Christians. Wash one another's feet when he, when he commands that is really a one another. Do this to one another. We get so many of those throughout the New Testament. Those help us understand that to be a Christian, we serve other Christians. Yes, we serve other people in this world. We serve our family, things like that. Um, often those things are more done out of duty and, and the need to um, uh, fulfill job roles or family responsibilities, things like that. But as a Christian, that begins to change, and it especially begins to change right within the body of Christ because, as we talked about earlier, we are to serve one another in humility. And we'll get even deeper into this. This one another is more specifically in this context. Um, this one another is in the context of Christian love. Uh, notice, if you know the upper room discourse, you know that later on, for, for instance, even in our own chapter in verse 30, 34, Jesus begins to give the disciples a command of unique Christian love. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you that you also love one another. And by, all this, or by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He continues this even in John chapter 15, and he helps them understand, look, there is a unique aspect of Christians and their love for one another because we serve the same Lord. We have experienced the same forgiveness in Christ. The world doesn't know that. The world hasn't tasted the beauty of that forgiveness in Christ. And so you may desire to, to uh, seek forgiveness by someone else and they don't want to extend it to you because they don't know that forgiveness in Christ. Y- you may go and ask for, um, for someone to forgive, uh, to, to, well, you might point out a sin in someone else's life and they may be an unbeliever's life and they may not repent. And yet you will still have that that heart of forgiveness. You desire to forgive them, but you can't, because you understand as a Christian, uh, forgiveness being an exchange, a transaction, you can't really extend that forgiveness until that person repents. And in the world, people create those separations because of sin, because they hold on to their sin. They create bitterness. They create a separation between one another. But when everything works together, right, especially right here within the body, Um, we're called to serve one another in that unique special love so that the body works like a well-oiled machine. We need to serve one another and give preference and honor to one another. If you look at Romans 12, 10, you don't have to turn there now, you can can write it down. It says, being devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. Really, that's a summary of what Christ is doing for, for his disciples here. We need to remember Christ's love for us, that he did this, this for us as much as he did it for his disciples, and it's been recorded for us so that we realize we need to serve one another. And be, be careful not to look at others and, and look, look at the sins that they commit and think more lowly of them. Because would you want others to look at you that way? Beware of looking on their sin and failures with that Pharisaic complacency and cold indifference. That's an easy way that, to get you stifled from serving your brother. And Galatians 6, 1 through 2 says, Brothers, even if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one of you looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You bear the burdens of your brothers and sisters. Do you speak, seek to re- restore one another in a spirit of gentleness and serve one another the way that Christ is calling here? The hardest thing to do is to be faithful by addressing sin head on. That's part of serving your brother and sister. I think it's so easy to compartmentalize Things. Oh yeah, serving is me serving in a specific, specific ministry, but you know, confronting sin or having to ask forgiveness for sin from a brother and sister is a whole other thing. That's not serving them, right? No, that's 
part of serving. It's part of your service as a Christian. It's all under that umbrella. And just one caution before we move along, and that is Christ is here is, one, is giving us a very explicit um, command that we are to follow his example in this. Do we follow Christ's example in everything that he did? That's actually not the way that we're called to follow Christ. We follow him in his character, but we do not act out his life as if we have the same mission to accomplish because we're not God in the flesh. What we want to do is look at what is Christ commanded? What have the apostles commanded? What did he say or what they said as an example? And that's what we're seeking to imitate Christ in. And just notice how the idea that we would um, that we need to be discerning and how we follow in Christ's example. Uh, right here in this very discourse, later in the chapter, he says in verse 33, where I'm going, you cannot come. He's saying, you can't follow me in this mission that I'm doing. But in what I just did, you need to, you need to follow me in that. You need to imitate me in that. So, after considering the expectation that Christ commanded, let us turn to the participation. The participation. John 13, 16 through 17. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one uh, who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do, do them. Well, these are the simplest two verses in this whole scene, but in some respects, they're the hardest. Verse 16 describes believers as slaves. Christ is our master, our Lord. Yet he humbled himself, and we're called to do the same. But verse 17, it is a conditional clause. If you know these things, this is the first part of the condition, you must first have knowledge before a blessing can come. Christians today downplay the importance of biblical knowledge. They'll say something like, Live the gospel. Uh, Love trumps doctrine. Uh, I don't need theology. I need Jesus. Is there a way in the sense in which you live out the gospel? Yeah, if you were to follow Christ's example on this, and that's in some sense. But if we're talking about the specific message of the gospel, charades isn't going to help anybody. All right? There's no way you're going to live that one out. All right? I don't care how good you are at charades. There's somebody I'm looking at right now. All right, so I don't care how good you are at charades, you've got to speak the gospel. And that helps us understand that that there's specific knowledge that we need to learn. Uh, And when we come, especially when you see certain uh, objections like this, it usually stems from um, the danger that, that people are afraid of, which is the idea of cold, lifeless religion, really the result of that ritualistic religion we were talking about earlier. Now, this is always a danger, regardless of whether or not um, it's ritualism or legalism, because that always flows out of the heart of man. But keep in mind, just like with any error, you cannot fix error with error. Anti-intellectualism is anti-Christ. Christ himself is a teacher, meaning you must learn and know that he, excuse me, what he teaches. Theology isn't optional. Theology is required. Without it, you're disqualified and susceptible to Satan's ploy and even apostasy. Why do you think so many Christians, or at least professing Christians today, end up deconstructing, quote-unquote? Knowledge must never stand alone, though, as we see right here. You must never have file cabinet theology, and really we hear the echoes of James here. But become doers of the word and not merely hearers only who delude themselves. That's James 1.22. God, God won't give you more light if you don't use the light you've been given. Are you being obedient to the very light that you've been given already? Jesus continues in this conditional clause. If then, if, if you know these things, then, then you are blessed or happy if you do them. The condition met without knowledge, but completed with action, excuse me, with knowledge, 
but completed with the action. So you start with the knowledge, and it must be completed by obe- obedience. And really, application, that takes effort, and it takes effort in the Christian life. You must put to practice that which you learn. And if you do, by the power supplied in the Christian life, then you will experience that happiness of Christian obedience. God is the God who extends happiness and pleasure to his creation because he is a God who is happy in himself. Isaiah 46, 8 through 10 says, I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Psalm 135, 6, whatever Yahweh pleases, he does. He does whatever he pleases. Ephesians 1, 5 through 6, and and even 12 and 14 says, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, and continues, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. God is delighted in being glorified, and he wants us to share in that delight. You can even go to places like Psalm 16 or Romans 7 to see how this is all played out, how it's played out even in the Christian life. But why evil sin? What is the worst evil? What if someone is, is innocently and brutally murdered? It happened once, but only once, and that was in Christ. Christ was the only one who was truly innocent. And guess what? God was pleased to crush him because there was a purpose in that. It was so that his grace would be shown to guilty sinners and there was a way that was made for them to be right with God. Why do I bring that up in the midst of talking about happiness and delight? Because it's only through that means, it's only through the death of his son that guilty sinners can come to know a holy and righteous God. And then, ultimately, to bring these image bearers who repent in faith to experience that happiness. Psalm 16, 11 says, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forever. And Psalm 36, seven through eight says, how precious is your loving kindness, O God. And the sons of men take refuge in the shadows of your wings. They are satisfied from the richness of your house and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. God has holy delights that we can delight in with him. And we should seek after that. Thomas Boston summarizes it this way. God's commands are not burdensome. They are beams of light guiding us along the path of righteousness. Joyful obedience is the soul's response to the light of God's word leading us to walk in his ways. And Thomas Watson says it like this, when we delight in God's commands, obedience becomes a privilege, not a burden. A privilege. Are you privileged to serve Christ in his church? Are you privileged to serve one another? Is that how you think about it? Because of sin, holy happiness becomes, um, comes primarily through this difficult struggle with sin. But that's not to say that you must first do it all through duty and then you get to the end and there's the delight. You can even find delight in going through that struggle with sin. Just like Paul said, suffering but always rejoicing. If you, if you lean upon Christ as you're living this Christian life, even as you're fighting sin, you can find joy and happiness and delight even in that. Now, we've looked at the Lord's demonstration and now the, even the expectation but let's look at the participation of his saints in joy. Uh, did I get that mixed up? Oh, excuse me. We've looked at his demonstration, his expectation, and the participation. Excuse me. And now we're going to look at the contemplation. The contemplation. And that's starting in verse 18. In verse 18. I do not speak about all of you. I know the ones that I have chosen but that the scriptures may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives anyone I send 
receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. After Christ teaches us the happiness of this blessed obedience, if we're obedient in him, that we can truly experience that blessed, that blessed delight. Now, he says, I do not speak about all of you. So he's saying, actually, there's someone that's even in the room with him in that moment who can't experience that holy delight. Who, he's, who is he referring to? We know from reading the context, especially in uh, the beginning of chapter 13, that it says that Judas Iscariot, or excuse me, verse 2, and during supper the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God, was going back to God. So, Judas Iscariot, Think about this for a moment. Uh, have you considered up to this point that one of those disciples that Jesus washed the feet of was Judas himself? He treated Judas like all the rest of the disciples in that moment. And the only one who got a rebuke in the moment was Peter. <laughs> well, now he's warning them of Judas, and it's not the first time he's done this. However, He's warning them of Judas, and I think there's three purposes in this, without actually calling him out specifically. First, our Lord says explicitly uh, that there's a traitor among them without pointing him out because he wants to cause those who are truly his, uh, the other disciples, to look at themselves and not to look at one another. He wants them to look within, to examine their own hearts. This is a serious moment of self-examination and really, in a lot of ways, preparation for for the Lord's Supper that's about to take place. The significance of this for you and I cannot be overstated. First, as, as a narrative, it's significant for those first disciples and that they're called to trust their Lord even though this traitor, Judas, resided among them. How hard would it be to have Christ telling you standing with a group of other guys you trusted that one of you is a traitor. You'd be tempted to just think, okay, well, everything I know is, is wrong. What's going on here? Uh, is it all these guys? It's just, it's just one of them? Well, he says it's just one of them, but if it's just one of them, who is it? The worldly temptations would abound. Christ had been warning them explicitly since John six seventy. He said, one of you is a devil. And that could have been weeks before this took place. And now he's calling to attention with just them present. There's no crowds, there's no Jewish leaders, it's just them. But to you and I, the further significance of this reality is the doctrine of the visible and invisible church. There will be those who come to us, but not, not really of us. 1 John 2.19 says, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they were of us, they would have remained with us. Many will gather in church as believers, but only Christ knows the heart of his people. He knows who are his. And notice he says, some of you do not believe. He says that, he said that back in John 6. In in John 10, he says, I know my own, and and my own know me. And here he says, I know the ones I have chosen. The visible church will always include believers and unbelievers. Both will profess Christ. The doctrine of the visible and invisible church necessitates another doctrine, one we're not ashamed to talk of here at Masters, and that is that there are false brethren. And to use that term specifically is something that Paul used, false brethren. Or we could say uh, uh, professing, false professors, um, we get the idea of false professors, it sounds in our day and age a little bit like, a, a co- we're not talking about a college teacher, right, a false professor. Uh, somebody who's going in and pretend to be a professor, no. We're talking about a false Christian. And we get that from, for instance, 1 Timothy 6.21 and Titus 1.16. Professing, some have gone astray, or professing, they deny by their lives. These are false professors. Some, some men lie to others and even to themselves because their father's the devil, just like the, Jesus said to the Pharisees. No man can know the heart of that individual until God exposes them. Are you then to be suspicious 
That's what you'd be tempted to be, right? To be suspicious of one another? The answer is no. You're called to put on Christian love. 1 Corinthians 13, you always think the best of your brothers and sisters. When, you're, when you serve them, you're, you're to think, this person is who they say they are. I'm going to trust Christ in, in all of this. You have to trust him no matter who he brings into the fold. This truth becomes, uh, excuse me, this truth removes the difficulty and mystery of our modern evangelical fad. I mentioned de- de- con- uh, deconstruction earlier. Deconstruction just simply means someone who apostatizes. All right, that's, we put it in biblical language. People may, may say, hey, I'm deconstructing my faith. I'm taking it apart and I'm going to put it back together, and it's going to be better afterwards. Yet usually it doesn't look anything like Christianity. All right, it's just apostasy. That's all it is. Let's just call it what it is. And based on this verse, we shouldn't be surprised. God's going to send Judas's into our midst. That's part of his plan. It shouldn't discourage anyone that there will be those false brothers among us. Do you trust the almighty hand of God in this? Ultimately, you must treat all professing Christians indiscriminately so long as there's no unrepentant visible sin. Talked about this so much here. That unrepentant visible sin would then, then, would then obligate you to say something, to go to them. And really, this happens in the life of believers. Unrepentant visible sin may start out that way because there's something going on in their heart and they need to deal with that. And that's why that Matthew 18 process is there. So once two brothers go, finally, maybe that person wakes up. Usually, really 90% of the time, we would expect that when you go through the process of um, church discipline, people repent. And praise the Lord that that's the, that's the case. We, we go about not being discriminate in the sense that we never suspect other people. We take them at their word. However, there is some ways that we do discriminate between brothers and sisters, not in a bad way, right, because our culture has made the word discriminate bad in every sense, right? Um, but what I mean by that is we, God has sovereignly placed all of you here in this body. All right, you may have a Christ, uh, uh, somebody you know who is a professing Christian brother or sister outside this body, at work, uh, maybe um, at a school that you're going to, right? Now, that person's not coming to this body. You may have some opportunities to serve them in some small ways in the context you're in with that person, but the way that there's a discrimination between them and the body here is that God has placed you in this body and all of you together so first and foremost, you should seek to, to serve one another who are here in this body before you serve anyone outside the church because God has not placed those people in your midst to be part of the body that you're part of. And so serve one another first. Don't give your gifts away to, to people outside the church and, and, and starve the body of the gifts that you could be giving right here, but rather seek to serve one another here because we need your gifts. We may not even know what they are, but you've got to start serving before we even know what they are. And there's so many great opportunities to serve in our church. And we were just talking about that this morning in one of our deacon meetings. Every time you begin to serve, there's there's a a temporariness to it. You're you're trying it out. Uh, You should never never start serving in a ministry and think, this has got to be permanent, I'm going to stay here, no matter how good you are or how bad you are at it. No, you should think, all right, I'm testing the water. And if my leaders say, hey, man, actually, you're not that great at it. Let's try it over here. You should be okay with that, all right? Uh, Let's humble ourselves in that regard. Every one of us should. Because there's things that each of us are good at and each of us are bad at. Um, And so be ready to serve, to serve humbly and faithfully, even if you're asked to move from one ministry to another. Because we need your gifts, and whatever those are, whatever they turn out to be, those unique, that unique mix of gifts, the body and the, everyone around here can benefit from that, and they should be benefiting from that. If they aren't, you're keeping them from benefiting from that. Well, coming back to the idea of a Judas in our midst, and it's not a pleasant thing to think about, 
Um, Second, I believe that Christ warns of Judas in their midst without pointing out him specifically to, for Judas, to give him yet another chance to repent. And notice, notice the love that Christ shows to Judas in this. Every man is responsible for his own sin, regardless of his moral inability. This is how you can love those unbelievers around you, those who who reveal their sin to you and refuse to repent. Continue calling to repentance in grace and love and kindness. Show them the gentleness of Christ. Because here, Christ showed so much patience with Judas, so much patience, constantly calling him out without calling him out, so to speak, right? By this time, Judas knows that Christ is talking about. He may not have necessarily picked up on it the first time Jesus said it, but by now, Judas knows. Judas knows that Christ is talking to him, even though he's not speaking his name. And this is a profound opportunity that he's being given by our Savior. If you haven't truly repented and trusted in Christ like Judas, now is the time to call out to Christ. Only Christ can set you free. In John 8, 34 through 36, Christ says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin, and the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Christ will not turn away anyone who comes to him. Today is the day of salvation. You need to repent and trust in Christ. Even Judas was given opportunities to repent. And third, I would say, Christ tells of this traitor in their midst because it confirms God's word. This is the most explicit that we see here. He says, But that the scripture may be fulfilled, he who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on I am telling you before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. And he quotes here from Psalm 41 and tells them that this scripture is being fulfilled in Judas's betrayal. And notice it uses the term heel. In Genesis chapter 3, it talks about the heel crushing the head of the serpent. Christ is identifying himself as the seed that will be victorious over the serpent. And connecting it with Psalm 41, he's fulfilling him. Uh, he's fulfilling the Davidic covenant as that seed of David that, we look, that they were looking forward to, to sit on the throne of David and to rule the nations. Christ is coming. He's the coming warrior king who will defeat that serpent. And it, really, in the work he's already done, he has already accomplished that victory. It has yet to be bore out practically in some ways, but that victory has been accomplished. Judas taking his life, just as, for instance, when David was betrayed by Ahithophel, that's just another divine divine seal upon the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that he is who he said he is. A theme by the Apostle John in writing his gospel is that Jesus is the Son of God. He is God the Son, God incarnate. John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus says to his disciples in the upper room, um, he says, from now on I am telling you before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. And here, he's, he's, we include the, verb, the, the word he as just a helper because really this is an I am statement. And there's many of these throughout the Gospel of John and one of the most notable being in John 8, 56-59, He's speaking to the Pharisees and he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. And they sought to stone him for that because they knew what he was saying. He's saying that I am God, I am the I am who was here eternally from before creation ever was and will be eternally after. Jesus in verse 19 is essentially saying, mark my words, I'll be betrayed by one of you and when it happens, this proves that I am who I say I am, that I am God the Son in the flesh. 
He follows this bombshell with this final contemplation that makes this, the, the great faith in God's sovereign promise stand out. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives anyone I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. First, this is an encouragement because they're being, they themselves, the disciples, are being sent by Christ. And that connects them to the Father. Anyone that they come to in the mission that they're called to, that connects them with the Father because they're doing what they're called to do. But this is also a note to them as they begin to build the church, as the church exists throughout history, and now we're here 2,000 years later, that whoever Christ sends to us, anyone in the church, we are to receive them because God is sending them. And some struggle to see, well, how does this verse, it's really interesting sometimes when you read commentaries, um, they struggle to see how this verse uh, connects to the previous one. And I just had to ask, what if Jesus sends a Judas? Do we receive him? The answer is yes. Even Jesus washed Judas' feet. This, this falls again into what we talked about earlier, the, the kind of the not your concern mentality. You need to trust Christ. You're, you need to be faithfully uninformed in this and trust that Christ is doing his will through whoever he sends into our body. Two lessons stem from this. Seek to render faithful service to your Lord regardless of who is in your midst. But how about we get someone who, for a while, who, who serves and, and, and looks like a Christian and even really encouraging as a Christian for a while, but then ends up in unrepentant sin? Well, anyone who goes through that process of church discipline and makes it to step four, God has sovereignly sent that person out for such an end. We must trust. And that does not mean we stop praying for them. It does not mean that as long as they have life and breath in them, we hope for restoration and repentance. We'll always seek that. And the second lesson is to seek to receive people in Christian love. If someone is going to fall, that is between them and the Lord. That's not your concern. In fact, you don't want to get involved in being concerned with that because you don't want to be responsible for pushing someone over the edge into that unrepentant sin. You don't want to be responsible for someone going into apostasy. So seek to, seek to in, in the sense that is appropriate, indiscriminately, Serve everyone within the body that is around you. Unless that sin, once again, is visible, an unrepentant sin, serve them, love them, think the best of them, have that unity and that Christian mindset that we read about in Philippians 2 this morning. Have one mind among yourselves. Consider others better than yourself. And perhaps this is the appropriate time to remind you in Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All whom God sends among us. It doesn't, doesn't mean that we approve or affirm or ignore their sin. That's what the culture does. That's what unbelievers do. We, we handle everything that has to do with sin, with humility and obedience to God's commands. As long as we see, receive everyone in loving obedience, using the scriptures as our guide, Christ promises to build his church here at Master's Bible Church. Do you trust God's hand and who he sends here? And there's much to contemplate in this final section, but in brief, we have looked at the demonstration, the expectation, the participation, and the contemplation of this amazing scene, this demonstration of foot washing by our Lord and Savior. The, the Lord gave us these four fundamentals of sacrificial love, and now you need to go and obey them. And in obeying them, you will then be able to experience that happiness that God promises. Yes, this Christian life is not easy. But notice this. Just imagine this for a moment. Imagine that every single person who repents and is justified and believes in Jesus Christ immediately is glorified. And now they're walking around. He's that they're glowing. 
right? And, and they're not getting older, and, and, and now they're going to church. Do you think people would come to Christ for Christ, or do you think people would come to Christ for the benefits? You see, we need to call people to repentance through the one thing that brings them to Christ, and that is the power of God through the gospel. Christ is, is the power of God unto salvation. Our lives, he has ordained that, yes, we will become gradually holy in our actions, but we'll still have that sin in our actions that will still connect us to the world, and it humbles us in the midst of that, and it helps other people to see that there's nothing special in us that they should be coming to Christ for. We're just lowly beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this text, this text of Christian humility and this demonstration by our Lord Jesus Christ. He showed us what it looks like to love one another. Let us do that today, even now, as we finish out this service as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, Lord. Help us to see the beauty of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have that impact how we act even in these remaining moments in our worship service. In Jesus' name, amen.